But uh, we're back on teaching home Bible studies, and teaching home Bible studies as just a kind of a recap. Uh, don't want you to think about just the mechanics of a chart, because if you do, you're going to waste a lot of time, and you're going to be very frustrated, because you're going to get through a 12-lesson Bible study that takes you 20 weeks to get through. And you're going to go through all of that. And if that's all you're doing is trying to teach that chart and get through it, you're going to be very disappointed in the results. And uh, so you, you, you've got to understand what's going on here. I, I don't know if the media has the pictures that, I, that Brother Wright sent. Uh, if you, you, you got it. Um, I want to show you a picture here. The first one about the chickens, brother. That ought to get their attention. All right. So here's a chart on growing chickens, okay? So uh, if you can see that chart goes there. In 1930, the average market weight of a broiler chicken was about two and a half pounds, and so uh, in 2010, the average weight of a chicken is 6.24 pounds, all right? Uh, in 1930, it took about 42 days for a chicken to gain a pound. Today, it takes 7.7 .7 days for a chicken to gain one pound. Uh, something's wrong with that picture. Now, the reason this was in the Wall Street Journal, and the reason they was writing the article is because they're having a problem with chickens. Okay, if you, I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but sometimes you get a pack of chicken breast, and one of them or uh, half of them, uh, when you cook them, they'll they'll just be stringy, and they they just okay. They call that there's a name for that. It's called woody breast. So it's fibrous. And so what they have discovered is they're having these chickens grow too fast, and it's causing problems. Now, we're all about speeding things up, but you can speed it up until you get a problem. And there's only so fast that you can make a disciple. Now, I'm all for speeding it up. But you have to start faking stuff. There's some hormone going on here. There, there, there's something. They're taking too many shortcuts. And you can, you can, it takes time to make a disciple. It takes time for the word of God to be planted and for it to germinate and for it to sprout and for it to grow and then to produce fruit, and there's only so much you can do to speed it up. This is not a factory. This, we're talking about life here. And, uh, yes, you know, you want to grow uh, uh, bigger tomatoes. You want to grow more. You want to increase the yield. But... When it comes to God's harvest, we can't take shortcuts with it. It's not going to do any good for you to have a church full of people that don't make it in the rapture. Right? And uh, people get impatient with the new convert process, the discipleship process. Nobody has ever really... Uh, gotten the Holy Ghost as quick as I wanted them to. Nobody's ever developed into a mature Christian as fast as I wanted them to. But I'm not in control of that process. And I, I want to push things as, as, as much as I can. And I want to learn to teach Bible studies very effectively, and I want to learn exactly when to put weight on people and when not to. I want, to, I, I want them to be mature, you know, I, I, and, and that happens different. I had three children, and, uh, you know, 
my daughter's my middle uh, child, so I have two sons, daughter in the middle. My daughter, well, I think was she's, uh, oh, my wife's going to kill me because I can't remember. I think she's 16 months younger than my oldest son, all right? So, but I think she was born more mature than he was, okay? Now, she, has just, she was just more responsible. It was just uh, my youngest son, uh, God love your heart, Chase, if you're watching this, but, you know, he's 27, and, you know, he's still just glad to be here. He's an electrical engineer. He's got a good job, but, you know, he, he wants to play video games, and I can't get him interested in getting married. I need more grandkids, and I just can't get him interested in doing it. You know, he's just developing. Uh, Raquel, uh, she was got married at 20 years old. Darren got married at 21 years old. They were ready to go. Uh, but Chase is still, you know, he's just glad to be here. Wearing t I said, son, you quit wearing t shirt you, You're 27 years old, you know. Uh, wear, wear proper clothes, you know. <laughs> just, love you, Chase. I love you. I really do. And he's a great guy. And he'll, he'll get it. But that's just his, he's on his time schedule. And, you know, I probably have damaged him a little bit. Sorry, buddy. Uh, pushing him, you know. <laughs> but uh, I don't want to damage him. I know I can push him too hard. I know what that looks like. I know you can be too relaxed. That Goldilocks thing is hard to do, to get it just right. And so the way you figure out how to get it just right is you push a little too hard. And you're sensitive and see if you get some pushback and then... I don't know, but we have to, when you're teaching a home Bible study, you're, and, and let me talk from a church planner perspective, okay, this is from a church planner perspective, you're, you're already involved in building this person into a disciple of Jesus, you are laying the foundation, you, you, you're starting to disciple and I know I don't believe you can disciple somebody that hadn't been born again, okay? So I, I, that's really where discipleship starts is after a person's born again. But you're putting a lot of stuff in them that they're going to reach back and get, right? And so you're laying a foundation. And so you've got to think about that. When I go to teach a Bible study, Brother Staten, I'm already seeing them for what they could be. And where they could go. And I already am watching and seeing the thing. I, I'm mapping out a strategy for them. I want to be able to say like the Apostle Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. And I am already discerning where I'm going to lead them and, and, and where they need to go and what God needs to do in their life. And so when we open up to Genesis... I'm already laying out the path for them for maturity. I, I'm already dealing with these things. I know salvation is coming, but there are other foundations. There's some things you've got to move out of people's life with the Word of God before they can even repent. The Word of God convicts people. And so you have to discern where they are. There are some people you walk in their house... They already repented. You don't have to spend time defining sin and, 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 and exposing them to the holiness of God and all of these things. You don't, they, they're ready. They're wanting to know. They, they, maybe they had some teaching in their background. Maybe uh, they've been on a long spiritual journey and God's brought them to you to get them born again. They may be like Nicodemus come to you in the middle of the night and say, Good Master, what must we do? You need to know that. Teaching a Bible study, that makes a world of difference in how you're teaching a Bible study to know where they're at. You've got to understand. Now, we talk about soteriology. That's the uh, study of salvation, or, or that is the, the theological understanding of how a person is saved. And uh, you can take whole Bible school classes on it. You read books on it. And you, you can know how a person is saved. And, and re repent, be baptized, fill with the Holy Ghost. And, and you can have know what it looks like when somebody's saved. But 
It starts with Ephesians 2. For by grace are you saved. God's grace. See, you, you, you got to know these theological things. You can't just go in and teach a Bible study and not know what you're doing. You've got to understand what you're doing. Uh, for by grace, grace has brought you into that person's home. They didn't deserve it. They hadn't been living right. They, uh, but God's grace has given them an opportunity to choose Him. Amen. Amen. The grace of God. Uh, and so, for by grace are you saved through faith. They will. Grace is God's part. They will have to believe God. They will have to exercise saving faith. And you're trying to... You know that faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Okay, so you're teaching the Word of God that's going to produce faith in them. But before you even, the, the fact you're there is a result of the grace of God. God's already working. There's no telling what kind of miracle has taken place to put you together to make sure that you're in that house teaching that Bible study. All of heaven has been working. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Your footsteps across that threshold. Or you meet at that coffee shop. That's the grace of God. You got to learn to see that. You got to learn to see God working. Uh, one of the things that God told Samuel about David. He said, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Well, that's not an indictment. That's just a fact. I can't see your heart. That doesn't make me bad. That just makes me not God. Okay? God's the only one that can see a heart. We are limited by the outward appearance. That doesn't mean we shouldn't look at people's outward appearance. That's how you find out what's going on, is looking at people's outward appearance. A lot, your outward appearance tells a lot about people. It just doesn't tell everything, right? And you've got to know that. So you've got to learn to see the invisible. Now, everybody can tell when somebody's got enough faith to be baptized. That's pretty obvious. Faith has resulted in them being baptized in Jesus' name. We can say, yes, they have faith. Look at that. They have faith. We can't really tell. We don't know if they're, they're, they don't, they're just faking it or not. Right? We're limited. We don't know if... I went to a Baptist school, you know, once saved, always saved. They taught that, you know. And so I'm like, well, how do you know? Uh, you know, well, what about people that are saved and then they don't ever live God? You know what the Baptist said? They say, well, they weren't really serious about it. <laughs> well, what now? What is it? Uh, it, it? You confess Jesus, but, oh, they wasn't really serious about it. No, no. Well, we don't, we don't know. Just because somebody gets baptized in Jesus' name, we don't really know if they were made a sincere commitment or not. We, now, we have to assume they did, right? I don't know when I marry two people if they're really going to stay together. I'm taking them at their word. You know, I mean, I'm just doing my part. So if somebody wants to be baptized, I'm going to baptize them, right? I mean, I baptized people. I, I was pretty sure they didn't. They wasn't sincere. But I, I wasn't 100% sure. They could have been. So I baptized them. <laughs> you know, I mean, what are the, what, we're limited. So we have to begin to look because here's the hardest question anybody ever deals with is when do you stop working with somebody? When do you stop teaching the Bible study? When do you say, I'm not going to pour anything? Well, here's the easy answer. Easy answer is when you when you determine they don't have faith. Stop working with them. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If you can determine definitively somebody doesn't have faith, then quit working with them. You're wasting your time. The trouble is that's hard to tell. <laughs> that's hard to tell definitively. 
and so most times, and most preachers, including me, you just keep going and going and going. Even when you're 99% sure, you're still trying to figure it out, right? Because faith, faith is what saves people. I'm going to say it again. Faith is what saves people. They have to have faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. We try to build that faith up through the Word of God. And you've got to learn that process. It's what I call practical soteriology. How people come to salvation. And Brother Cornwell, years ago, uh, used this. He uses the deliverance from... Egypt of the children of Israel to talk about the Bible study process. Well, I'm going to do that today too in my way, uh, but I, I originally started thinking this way because of Brother Cornwell. It really opened my eyes to see the process, and, and you have to be able to see the process. We teach a, a session very similar to this at launch, and we use the, not the analogy of them coming out of Egypt, but a birth. The birth process is a another way and so when somebody's born again when somebody's delivered from the world there is a uh, there's unlimited steps to it it's not a three step four step ten step it can be unlimited steps to it but it's all leading to faith leading to faith that then comes to uh, full uh, fruition in the exercise of saving faith obedience to repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, infilling of the Holy Ghost. And then it doesn't stop there. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. And so you and I today, we're still in that process of living by faith. We do believe uh, that in um, the perseverance of the saints, nobody can make you be lost. Nobody's going to be able to take you out of God's hand. Uh, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, but you can change your mind. You can stop believing God. Now, as apostolics, and, and it's just as a biblical principle, I don't have time to teach all of this, but the theological principle on faith is faith and obedience cannot be separated. You can't say you believe and then not obey. You have to, oh, we know that people have faith because of obedience. Now you can obey in a legalistic way. But the only way I can be 98% sure that you have faith is to observe your obedience to God's Word. Amen. When you believe something, it changes your actions. You know that I believe in gravity... Because I, when I go up these steps, I come right back down these steps. I don't jump off over here. You know I have faith in gravity, but I don't jump off tall buildings. I, when I'm in an airplane, I pray before the airplane takes off. And I'm in a lot of airplanes, and I'm like, Jesus, keep me safe. I was on the airplane, I dozed off, we was on the runway, and thing took off and I'm sleeping through it but when it, when it the wheels came off something happened and one of those wheels locked up it was spinning and it, it went bam well man I, I said Jesus <laughs> Every, everybody looked around I said I got it. everybody prayed for her. I said I prayed for everybody <laughs> <So>, I <laughs> Now, I get on the plane because I also believe in the law of aerodynamics. I believe that works too. And so, faith is evidence. What you believe changes what you do. Don't keep teaching somebody a Bible study that won't obey God. Now, there's a pro tip for you. Find out what people do know about the Word of God. Some people don't know much at all about the Word of God. They, you go to lunch with them, they're using the F word, and 
They don't know any better. They're not doing it to be mean. They're not. They don't know. There's people living together. They think they've been taught that's what you do. They, they've been taught it'd be stupid for you to marry somebody you hadn't lived with for six months. You know, I mean, that's, to them, that's just common sense. They don't know anything about fornication and all that. They, they, they're just, but there, there's something that they do know. There's got to be something about the Word of God that they know. Are they obeying God in that small thing? That's how you see faith. Some people become convinced they know I should go to church. And then they don't go to church. Think about it. People aren't saved by what they know. Talk about the light doctrine. People saved by the amount of light they get. Nobody's saved by the amount of light they have. Everybody's condemned by the amount of light they have. Because everybody's disobeyed the amount of light they have. The heathen out on an island that has never heard about Jesus is looking up. He knows something, and you know what? He's disobeyed it. He's figured out something about God from creation, and Brother Staten, he's in disobedience to it. Everybody, all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. So you, you look, though, for people to start reversing that process, and so they start obeying. And so you, one of the first things that is a big indicator of faith is they let you come teach them a Bible study. Right? I assume everybody that lets me come to their house and teach them a Bible study has some faith. Why else would I be there? They blocked off an hour. That's pretty good. And they're listening to me. That's why it's so hard to stop a Bible study. Because as long as they're letting you come over, you know, uh, so faith process starts. So when the children of Israel, God was, it was time for God to deliver them. So they're in bondage, right? The Pharaoh represents the devil. Egypt represents the world. Uh, Moses, you're Moses. You're the preacher. God's using you to deliver them from the devil. And that's the story. These things were an example to us. And so there's people that you work with, people in your neighborhood that are in bondage. The devil is in control of their life. He has them in slavery. And God has sent you to tell the devil, let my people go. That's teaching home Bible study. That's what you're doing. you got to know that. Driving to the home Bible study, you got to go deal with Pharaoh. That's what you're doing. You're going there to deliver them. You're saying to the devil when you drive up into that driveway, let my people go. And you got about as much power yourself as Moses does. Moses said, Who, me? Yeah. But God is sending you. God, the mercy of God. You're on mission from God. you got to know that. I don't care if you're teaching a doctor. I don't care if you're teaching the president. It doesn't matter who you're teaching. You are representing God. One of the first Bible studies I had in Ann Arbor, I didn't know who the guy was. We did some random phone calling, and he decided... One of the other people called. He said, "I want to talk to your pastor." He asked me. He said, "Yeah." He said, "I'd like." To. He said, "I'd like a Bible study, but I want a Bible study with your pastor." Well, I'm 28 years old. I didn't really have all that figured out. If I nowadays, I don't know. Oh, this guy wants to convert me. That's why he's having me come over. I didn't know that then. He just said yes. I had very few yeses, so I was just shouting, praising God for a yes. So I went over, and uh, I, he lived in a really nice house. And so we drove up, and, and for five weeks, oh, my word, I died in the wool, Calvinist. I mean, he wanted to go through baptism in the Greek, 
and I was wound up at Concordia College digging through stuff I never even knew existed. I was, but I, God was with us. But uh, finally, he kicked me out after the fifth week because I was converting his wife. <laughs> I was making progress. But I didn't know that he was a head of neurosurgery at the University of Michigan Hospital. I had no idea who it was. But, you know, I didn't care who it was. I'm Moses. You are in bondage whether you know it or not. The, what the children of Israel tell Moses, they, leave us alone. You're just making it worse on us. But Moses went anyway. And so the first thing you have to know, you have to know people are in bondage. You know, there's some people that don't believe people in the world are in bondage. There's some people that walk in people's house and say, Ooh, look at what all they got. Oh, I want to be, I want them to accept me. These are the cool people. No, they're not. They're in bondage. They just are, they're just, they're not in bondage with homelessness. They're in bondage with material wealth. But it's a chain all the same. I was walking into Starbucks. I love Ann Arbor. Still love Ann Arbor. I can cry about Ann Arbor just a little bit. <laughs> it's never far away. But I was walking up to the Starbucks one day, and there was a red Ferrari over here and a yellow Lamborghini over here. And I thought, man, what a cool city. I love this city. I'm, you know, and I did. I just love it. I love the people. 88% uh, uh, of the people in Ann Arbor had a bachelor's degree, 51% had a master's degree or higher. Most educated city in the world. A lot of cool things. And the Lord spoke to me. I'm walking up to that Starbucks. He said, are you trying to be accepted by them or are you trying to be accepted by me? And he revealed something in my heart. I wanted these people to like me. That'll mess you up. You're there to please God. People are going to naturally reject what you have to say that are in bondage to Satan. You've got to lead them. Moses worried about being accepted by the people of Israel. He had left a long time ago. But Moses was on mission for God. He was on a mission from God. You're on a mission from God. And so it, it, you can't be overly concerned about what people think about you. You've got to be concerned about what God is thinking about you. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. It, when people are lost, they are looking for somebody that can help them find the way. And if you get overly concerned and enamored with what position they have, what material wealth they have, what power they have, they get that every day. They're looking for a man or a woman of God that will walk in their life and tell them what's for. Tell them what God is saying. They're looking for a way out. They've tried all of that. They know it doesn't work. That's one thing I liked about Ann Arbor. They, they had enough education. They knew education wasn't the answer. Except the people that were still working, but the people who had already been through it. They already had the PhD. They, already had, they knew how empty it was. Looking for something real. And so you're, you're trying to get faith awakened in them. And so you look at what the... Um, you, you look at what... Moses and God did in that situation. He, he, uh, first of all, Moses had to be convinced that God was powerful and God could do it. You'll never be a good home Bible study teacher if you're not convinced that God can change these people. How else are you going to walk into a crack addict's life with a Bible study chart and tell him God's going to fix him? If you don't believe it. 
How can you walk into a marriage? There's been multiple affairs. They've been abused. They've been all kind of things. And they're, they're saying, could you help us, Pastor? you got to say, yes, I can help you. Yeah. Not because you have confidence in your own self, but you have confidence in the redeeming power of Jesus Christ and his ability to change people's nature, to change their past. Yeah. Oh, you got to believe it. And somewhere along the line, you're going to run into a burning bush. Somewhere along the line, you're going to throw that rod down. It's going to become a snake. And then you're going to have to pick it up because God's got to convince you. You've got to have faith that they don't have yet. They don't have enough faith to get out of their situation. But you should have enough faith for them to get out of their situation. You got to believe it. I believe it. I believe it. You get around Brother Staten for two minutes, you'll know he believes it. It doesn't matter. You bring them on with all their problems. Bring them on. Because we got the answer, Brother Staten. If they'll do what I tell them to do and they'll listen to me teach the Word of God, they will be changed. I don't, I, I don't doubt that a second. Nobody's too far gone for God. And you walk in the house with that faith. Woo! Mountains start moving. Mountains start moving. I love for people to tell me they got a need. They lost their job or they got cancer or something. I say, let's pray right now. Right now, let's pray. God gives you a job tomorrow. And I say, well, God, do it. Wait, show up. He said, you said you'd do it. Here you go. Here's your opportunity. Boom. You can't, let me tell you this. If you don't remember anything else I say, you remember this right here. People can't be delivered without a miracle. And never getting out of Egypt without a miracle. There's going to be a miracle. Are they going to stay in Egypt? This is miracle territory. Miracle territory is not getting people that's been in church for 50 years and going to heaven healed. We all want to pray. Some poor pray. They're going to heaven. Canaan land is just in sight. They're about to get into the joy. We were spending all this time praying for them to be. No, God, do miracles out in the street for people that need to know the power of God. That's where miracle power happens. That's where God shows up. Amen. Look for opportunities because you got to know there's got to be a miracle. You say, okay, because they've got to trust you. It's a miracle that somebody that you don't know from Adam, you just met them, and they're going to open up their whole life to you, tell you all of their dirty laundry, and they're going to let you in, and then they're going, you're going to tell them. This, we're, we're talking about a level of trust a lot higher than a financial advisor. They're trusting you with their eternal soul. And God has to make that happen. If it doesn't happen, you can't lead them out. You can't lead them out. They won't follow you. You're going to have to say some hard things to people. You're going to, you can't be a disciple unless you're willing to let God change things that you care deeply about. Everybody let God change a peripheral. Everybody let God take their pain away. Everybody let God fix the things they won't fix. But a disciple lets God touch the things they care the most deeply about. Oh, God. There's coming a time in that person's life. I, don't, I wish God wouldn't do it. I, he didn't ask me about it. But there's going to come a time in that person's life. They're going to be doing good. And they're going to say, I've kept all the commandments. And God's going to find the one thing. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. He's going to find the one thing that's precious to them. And he's going to ask them for it. And there's nothing you can do about it. 
Brother Hankins, you go, you, you're like, oh, God, don't do that. Don't do that. I got two years in this person. I know that they, they, they won't let me talk to it. Don't, 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 God. And he does it anyway. He just marches. That place that you were scared to touch. You would never talk. God just. They got to believe. They got to have faith. They got to have enough faith to get them through that. They got to believe God's word strong enough. Otherwise, they're going to turn around and walk away sorrowfully. And you know that walking in. You know that walking in, don't you, Brother Stay? You know it walking in. You know where it all is going. And if you don't know where all of it is going, that's why I keep talking about the end, because you've got to begin with the end in mind. So I'm talking to you about chickens. It takes a while. You're in it for the long haul. I don't care if you teach a one-hour Bible study, but if you think you're going to make a convert in an hour, you, you, you're nuts. <laughs> okay? Teach them a one-hour Bible study, but there's no such thing as a one-hour convert. Just like there really ain't no such thing as seven-day chickens <clears throat> or whatever it is. All right. <clears throat> you got to believe it. You got to know it. You can't lead people where you haven't been. Has God walked into your life and touched you in that spot yet? What'd you say? Have you got stuff in your life you won't let God deal with? You can't lead somebody where you haven't been. That's why in the church a lot of times, in a larger church, you'll see, that's why this is the difference between church growth and church planting. In church growth, a one person can invite them. They got enough faith to invite them. Another person might can have enough faith to pray them through the Holy Ghost. But if the person that invited them has to lead them to the end, it won't ever happen. Because a lot of times a person who invited them, they've never been to the end. Right? And so it takes, you can, you can triple team them, quadruple team them. And that's good. But you're a church planner, there ain't no quadruple team. There's one team. And Brother West, there's one team. You got to take them to the finish line. And that's why uh, not everybody is prepared to plant a church. Uh, uh, not everybody is going to make disciples. There's some people in your church, you don't want to, you reproduce what you are, not what you want to be. Right? Yeah. yeah. You reproduce what you are. And so there's some people, you don't want them reproducing who they are in the church, okay? It's okay for them to get them here. But that faith has to, you have to begin with the end in mind. I'm on point one, okay, if y'all wondering, okay? <laughs> it's all about faith. That's, that's number one. <laughs> number two, uh, you must lead them from immature faith to mature faith. And they must trust you. I've already touched on that. They must trust you in order to lead people from, what is about that? From faith to faith, ever increasing faith. People's faith starts off small. You have to lead them to ever increasing faith. Some people say, oh, they had faith. They're saved. No, they're not. They're going to, they had faith. That's right. But that faith has to increase it. And they have to trust you. And God's going to lead situations. There's going to be miracles. This is where the miracles come in. There's going to be that strong bond of trust and the working of the Holy Ghost. Third point. Uh, you, you ha as you ascertain where that student is in their faith process, you have to tailor your teaching. You know, you can teach... Anything from any lesson in the Bible study. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter if you're in Genesis or if you're in Revelation. You teach what they need to go to the next step of faith. You, you have to be flexible. 
you have to make sure that you're not concerned about your agenda. You're trying to get them to the next step. If you're leading a six-year-old across a stream, you don't go at the same pace as you do a 30-year-old. You got to ascertain where they are, what they need, and that's how you teach the Bible study. You let them set the pace of that Bible study because you're not concerned about where you're going. You're concerned about where they're going. And sometimes it takes them a long time to get across the stream. I taught a Chinese national who was in Ann Arbor to get his Ph.D. I taught him for six months on the first Bible study. I couldn't get him past the point of believing there was a God. All I could get him to was there might be a God. He started off, there is no God. Then he said, well, there may be a God. I had him over to my house. I taught him how to make French fries. I, I, I did the relational thing. I did the teaching thing. I did everything I knew to get him across that stream. And I never got him across the stream. But there was no need to talk to him about Jesus' name, baptism, until he believed there's a God. And there just was no need to go any further. I pulled out everything that I could. I tried my hardest, and I couldn't get him past it. Uh, I have taught people for a long time. I, I, Donna was a Lutheran Sunday school teacher. Uh, she had been teaching Lutheran Sunday school for 50 years. She sat through Bible studies. She got on baptism. And, uh, oh, she just couldn't understand. I was teaching that you had to be immersed and the name of Jesus had to be called over you for the baptism to be valid. Oh, she had a bunch of questions about that. And so I just answered her questions. I answered her questions. She, we got, she finally moved on. I had her in a group. She was in a group Bible study. So she, we, we had to keep moving. Donna decided to sign up for the other Bible study. She went through it again. And she got to the same place. Questions, questions. Finally, she told me, she said, Pastor, she said, my, her family filled up, filled up two rows of Lutheran uh, church. And she said, my grand." Son's getting baptized Sunday. I'm going to see what they say. And so she came back the next week. She said, Pastor, they said Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. She said, but I asked the priest, shouldn't you have done that in Jesus' name? He said, well, Donna, probably. I said, but we've been doing it this way for a very long time. Well, that's all she needed. I baptized her the next week. And I baptized her. Amen. It takes some people a long time to get over that. They, they just got to get over that, and they, they got to come to it. You can't trick them into it. They got to make the decision. It's excruciating. I taught a guy for five years a Bible study. His wife was in church. He was coming to church. He wouldn't get baptized. He was Catholic. He knew what it meant. It knew, he knew that he was uh, turning his back on the Catholic Church, and according to the Catholic Church, he would be excommunicated and uh, condemned to hell and banned from the church. He knew what it meant. But I kept teaching. He's a deacon in the church today. He's on the church board today. He got baptized, got the Holy Ghost. But it takes... You're teaching a Bible study. Sometimes you... Uh, Donna, back to Donna. She decided to come to church. She needed the Holy Ghost. She got baptized. She needed the Holy Ghost. And I was worried about her coming to church, to tell you the truth, because people get wild, you know, and I didn't want them to run her off. But she's my sweet little Lutheran lady over here that I've been gently, gently working on. Well, I turned my back, and would you know, somebody had her out in the aisle, jumping up and down with her. I said, oh, Jesus, help us, Lord. I Two years worth of work, and I'm, I'm, I'm going over here. I'm coming, to, I'm coming to, to help Donna. By the time I get over there, she's speaking in tongues. She's speaking in tongues. I, oh, praise God. <laughs> I 
You never know how it's going to turn out. You just never know how it's going to turn out. You're not in charge of it. They're, they're God's babies. Don't mean you don't try, though. <laughs> you, keep, you do the best you can. Um, one thing you're going to, as they're coming out of Egypt, they've got to believe you. I, there, like I said, there's infinite steps in it. If anybody, somebody was advertising not too long ago, a church in a box. I said, whoever, church in a box? Are you kidding? How about a marriage in a box? You know, how about child rearing in a box? I mean, they, they have to know that they're in bondage. Some people, you can't ever... This is, this is the problem when in people who are highly educated and have all money, marbles, and chalk and everything is going well. They have a hard time admitting they're in bondage. They don't want to say, I'm in bondage. You know, the Israelites never did really say that fully. Jesus is teaching the Pharisees. They said, we've never been in the bondage to any man. I mean, they've been in bondage for, for 1,500 years. They've been in bondage. We've never been in a bondage any man. Jesus just rolled his eyes and kept on teaching. <laughs> Nicodemus comes by night. He didn't want to admit it in the daylight. This is rich people. That's why it's hard for them to come into the kingdom of God. But with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. They just have a hard time. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And, 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 but you've got to keep teaching the word of God. That's why I was preaching I, that panoramic view. You've got, to see, you've got to let them see the panoramic view of the, the whole story of humanity and how God is so holy and how man is so wicked. And they've got to realize all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. To offend in one little area of the law is to be guilty of all of it. And, and how, that is somehow they've got to get to that Isaiah moment where they see the Lord high and lifted up and His train fills a temple and they say, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. They've been trying all their life to make sure that they're... They've been giving money away. They've been doing good for everybody. They've been doing all these good works, just like the rich young ruler. And they want credit for it. And there's no credit for it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They've got to admit it. Children of Israel had a hard time admitting it. And you're looking for that. You're looking for that. You're trying to lead them to it. You're teaching the Old Testament. The whole purpose of the Old Testament is to make people realize how holy God is and how impossible it is for them to be holy. That's the whole point of the Old Testament. Is look how holy God is and look how low you are. That's the whole purpose of it. And that's what you've got to teach in your Bible study. You've got to teach them how great God is. You don't have to say... Look how bad you are. You just got to teach the Bible. The Bible tells them that. Amen. Holy Ghost. That's conviction. Conviction. And they begin to say, hey, I need a Savior. I need a Savior. And, and that's why I, I'm going to say something really hard nose here. I'm trying to get adjusted to this new role. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm be more diplomatic. But sometimes you just got to make the point. That's why a lot of times people want to go to poor people and prey on them. Poor people, Satan's already sh stripped them of every bit of human dignity that they have. They already feel terrible about themselves. 
and a preacher comes by that's worried about a bunch of numbers and so he can make a post on Facebook and he it's malpractice and he say you're a sinner and you need to be baptized today yeah. and guys you're right and he gets baptized because he feels bad and he's got low self-esteem and you've got a suit on and he thinks everybody that's got a suit on and everybody that's got more money than him is better than him and he wants to please you and so he goes, gets in the water and his life is not changed because he doesn't have any faith. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, God gets mad about it. He didn't do that to people. He went and ate with them. He hang, hung out with them. He loved them. He showed them compassion. He showed them that they were worth something. There's some people you need to bring down, but there's some people you need to bring up. There's some people you need to bring up so they can realize that their life matters and their decisions matter. Tell you, you want to get God mad, you start messing with people. This isn't about, you know, we get a lot of pressure to perform. We get a lot of pressure from our peers. Preachers do anyway. You know, how many are you running? How many you got? How many you have baptized? What, whatever. Who cares? It all goes to God anyway. I'm, I'm as much about numbers as anybody. I don't, but in the proper context. It's okay. If God called you to a place to preach 30 years with no converts, Jeremiah, you just go preach somewhere for 30 years with no converts. You're still doing the work of God. Don't take shortcut. Don't take a shortcut. We got, we've had over the last decade dozens of young preachers that were trying to measure themselves by the mega church crowd and, and they start trying to make true apostolic converts and they're they're frustrated with the process and they're like well you're you're that process is robbing me of my success and me making a name and so they 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 go and you you want to go do that that's not church that's not making converts like jesus did you doing something but you ain't making you you're not doing what the apostles did anyway You got to stay focused on conversion. They got to get through the cloud. They got to get through the sea. That's the only way to get rid of Egypt. They're not there yet. They may have made a lot of progress, but the devil's coming for them. You got to get them buried in the water. You got to get them filled with the spirit. Uh, and let's just talk a little technical issue here. I know what people are saying when they're talking about the discipleship process begins on day one. But you've got to be careful with that. Because everything can be undone in a minute. If, 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 if Pharaoh makes it before you get to the sea and you get in the cloud, you're going back to Egypt. It's the cloud and the sea that keeps you from the devil. That's when his, his, his armies are buried. That's when you get deliverance. You can't get, and you do sometimes. You work with people as getting them off alcohol and, and drugs and stuff before they get the Holy Ghost. You do some of that. You, you may even send them to AA. Whatever. They'll go to. Okay. But that's not going to save them. You got to get them through the cloud, through the sea. If they just, if all you've done is get somebody to a treatment center, you, you, you and you hadn't gotten them through the cloud and through the sea, you are not doing any good for them. They've got to be born again. Y'all believe that? Amen. Amen. Uh, church planners, God loved their heart. Some of them, they got 30 people coming to church, and they're so proud of that 30. 30 feels good when you've been running 15. 30 feels like a full building. I'm telling you, it's, 30 is good. Right? And, uh, man, you feel like, man, I have arrived. I got 30. Well, 
sometimes 16 of them don't have the Holy Ghost, right? And that's okay, except three years later, 16 of them don't have the Holy Ghost. You, if you're not picking them off one by one, it, it, moving them forward, oh, you're going to be wore out. Trying to keep people saved that don't have the Holy Ghost, you better be thank God you're not a Baptist preacher. I'm going to tell you, that's got to be the worst way to make a living in the world. Trying to keep people saved that don't have the Holy Ghost. Oh, my word. I went to a Baptist school. I know what they're like. They measure, the uh, Baptist school I went to, they measured the girls' heels. They made sure, they, they'd take a ruler up the back of my head. And if my hair fell over that ruler, I had to go leave school, go get a haircut. Meanwhile, the pastor was sleeping with the principals, and uh, it was a mess. Holiness without the Holy Ghost is ridiculous. And you know what? Sometimes because you don't want to say, why haven't you been baptized? Sometimes you got to say, hey, what's the deal? Why won't you get baptized? Well, I've been through that three times. Why won't you get baptized? Some, I, I had evangelists come in. I said, you got one job. I paid. It probably cost me $2,500 to get this evangelist coming. I said, you see that couple right there? I said, I want them speaking in tongues before you leave. I said, you got one job. And we had Friday night. We had Saturday night. They still... It was Sunday. He said, I'm getting to it. He said, I'm going to get them. I said, you better. <laughs> I said, and you know what? They got the Holy Ghost. They got the Holy Ghost. Man, I can't keep people saved that don't have the Holy Ghost. I ain't about to have a whole bunch of people hanging on me, me trying to talk them into living for God. I want the Holy Ghost talking them into living for God. I talked to church where they wore out because they got a bunch of codependent saints. They're trying to be the Holy Ghost. You can't be the Holy Ghost. Moses was about wore out. But thank God Moses, <laughs> I'll tell you, that's a funny thing. God got mad at, mad at the people. Moses said, hey, God, calm down. Don't kill them. Don't kill him. God was ready to kill him. <laughs> Moses was. <laughs> Even God gets mad at people sometimes. <laughs> this free will thing. I, I, I know God's perfect. He thought it through. But sometimes you wonder, man, God, why don't, why don't you just make people do stuff? I mean, and, and it's funny. You watch God. Sometimes he almost does. Talk to Jonah. If God didn't violate Jonah's free will, he got really close. <laughs> I mean, he, he may have crossed the line on that a little bit. He just <laughs> That's some pretty hard pressure right there. <laughs> oh, goodness. I love, you, you know what, you, you get addicted to winning souls. You really do get addicted to it. And then you, want, and then you know why you've been saved. I'm fifth generation. I didn't even know why I'd been saved until I started winning souls. I didn't even know. My experience with God was so one-dimensional before I started winning souls. I didn't even understand what God had delivered me from. That's why young people that's been raised in church sometimes are always looking at the world, always looking at the world, because they, they don't even know. They've just been, they, they, they don't know what the devil has in store for them. They don't know the pain of sin. They don't know all of that, and I'm glad they don't. But you know what? You need to get involved in winning souls and delivering people. You know, you can, I, I thank God I didn't have to go out into the world to figure it out. I thank God I got into other people's lives and helped pull them out and said, man, I never want to be there. Thank God for, I, I, I was able to appreciate my heritage when I saw what God, where God delivered people from. Amen.
Praise God. There's going to be, Brother, brother uh, Cornwell talks about the crisis. There's going to be a crisis in everybody's life. I, I just alluded to it with the rich young ruler moment. That the children of Israel had a crisis before that Red Sea. They, they, before they, 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 they wanted to turn back. They, Moses, you brought us out here to kill us. You, you're teaching that Bible study, everything's going good, and then all of a sudden, one day, the wheels come off. And you know what? God's always in it. God doesn't trick people to get them to the altar. Somebody's got something in their life they really uh, precious, uh, and they don't want God to mess with before he seals them with his Holy Spirit. He's going to bring it up to them. Because repentance has to be real. I said repentance has to be real. You have to really be sorry for your sin. You have to really believe that you want God to be the Lord of your life. I wish the Baptists hadn't made it up so, messed it up so bad. It'd be a good thing if one of the first steps was to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. And say, God, I do. I'm tired of running my own life. I want you to run my life. That's what repentance is. It's a turn around. And, and it's, it's turning from uh, self-rule and, and, and Satan rule. Because we have to give Satan permission to rule in our life too. And we turn toward God. Well, that means something. And there's a lot of times that God will bring... A person, they'll say they repented, but there's something they're not fully repented of. They say they were surrendering control of their life, but they're not really. And so God just highlights it. For example, some people love their family more than they love God. And so, but as they're making steps toward God, and they're ready to go through the cloud, through the sea, all of a sudden... Family pops up. Says, you mean you're going to an apostolic church? That's a cult. Those people, you can't go there. That's false doctrine. That's false teaching. Everything blows up. They get on the internet. Find a bunch of bitter ex-Pentecostals. You know, you... you you, you can find a bunch of bitter ex-Catholics. You can find a bunch of bitter ex-Methodists. You can find a bunch of bitter ex-everything. We're not the only ones. We've got a bunch of bitter exes out there. And they get and read all that stuff. You know what? God's not too worried about that. Because he's not interested in somebody just making a commitment that didn't know what they were doing. I told my wife when I proposed to her, I told her, I said, babe, I'm called to be a missionary. I said, we're never going to have nothing. I said, I just want you to know that. I said, we're going to be somewhere. And I said, we may not ever own a house. I told her, I said, we may not ever own furniture. I said, I'm called, I know I'm called to be a missionary. And she said, yes, anyway. And she meant it. I wanted her to mean it. I've never felt any pressure to, other than just, I want to give my wife the best things I can. She has a house, she has furniture, thank God. But you know what? She'd, she'd walk away from it all tomorrow. If, if, if I decided that I was called to global missions and to go to Africa, I, I could resign this job, sell everything, and Carla would say, well, babe, let's go. Because we made that commitment a long time ago. And that's what God wants with people that follow Him. He wants somebody to make the commitment with their eyes wide open. And you shouldn't want people to be hidden from all the stuff. Hey, it's okay. Got questions? Answer, ask, ask them. We'll, we'll give you an answer. Yep, nope. We're outside the mainstream. Yep, we're considered uh, uh, unorthodox. Yep, that's right. Yep, we don't believe in any of the church councils. Don't believe in none of them. Don't believe the church fathers knew a thing what they were talking about. They were so wrapped up in Greek philosophy, they didn't know a thing about the Bible. Yep. 
had Catholic. So, well, now, who's your bishop? I said, Jesus, my bishop. Well, I mean, is there? No, God created his church, church run by the five-fold ministry. Uh, we're not, we don't interpret the Bible on our own. There's not a private interpretation. But people are like precious faith. We, we fellowship with one another in our local church. We have deacons, elders. We have the five-fold ministry. And we're connected to other churches that believe and teach like us. And so we check our beliefs against one another. That's how we come to it. Oh, so you don't have a pope? Nope, no pope. That's how it was in the New Testament. That's the way God set it up. Oh, okay. Just asking. All right. Now you know. People have to make a decision to serve God. You see, I'm not for planting a bunch of churches that become forever daughter works. And, I, and whatever your structure is, but forever babies. I don't want a bunch of kids living in my basement and me feeding them all the time. I want them to grow up and get their own job. In fact, I, want, I told my son, I said, I'm a poor preacher. You need to take care of me when I get old. I said, I, I'm, I'm counting on one. I got, I got one of them in the ministry. I, I know he can't take care of me. I, I said, somebody got to get a good job around here. <laughs> and if you don't create strong disciples you'll never build a strong church strong churches are built on strong disciples and if you're making disciples that don't know what they're doing you kind of tricked them into it trying to hide what you really teach and who you really are and expect to build a self-supporting strong church that sends missionaries it's not going to happen you got to build Strong churches on strong, and, and, and strong people are built on strong faith. Hallelujah. Strong faith in God. Everybody's going to go through some sorrow and some hurt. There's going to come a time when you have to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Amen. I don't know if y'all enjoyed this, but I'm having a blast. <laughs> I'm going to have to stop. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Amen. I, I, I hadn't been able to talk like this in a while. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand. Amen. Praise God.